Never in my wildest dreams did I envision delivering my presidential address from my home in Indiana to your home. A first among many firsts that have been a direct consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic, a disruptive force the likes of which has not been seen for over 100 years. Since we last met two years ago at the AAN annual meeting in Philadelphia, who among us could have imagined a world of social and physical distancing, donning face masks before we left our homes, and more hand washing per hour than we experienced during our surgical rotations in medical school. Over 150 million infections and now approaching 3 million deaths worldwide. The changes and uncertainties resulting from the pandemic have been dramatic and for many of us, overwhelming. If you are still experiencing the fallout of lingering disruption in your practice, academic center, or research institution, you are certainly not alone. And I want to share with you how through lessons I learned from my father, I was able to implement a process which tackled these disruptive changes head on, and as a result, found solutions for success. This past year in the United States, we not only had to take on the challenges of the coronavirus, but also had the profound social unrest that arose from the tragic killing of George Floyd and the political unrest as a consequence of our presidential and senatorial elections. Changes that resulted from the declaration of the public health emergency in March 2020 included the immediate closure of the AAN headquarters, closure of many of your practices and clinics, closure of research labs, and a halt to traditional medical education, and the cancellation for the first time in our 72-year history, the AAN annual meeting in Toronto. Challenges that resulted from the extreme social unrest riots breaking out across the U.S. last summer, and the emergence of extremist groups from both the right and left intent on continued disruption. Our most recent political unrest as a result of our elections with the January 6th breach of the U.S. Capitol building and the second impeachment of a sitting U.S. president. Now certainly just one of these disruptors would have been more than enough for an organization to address. But all of these, within a year's time, felt like the perfect storm followed by a tsunami. How in the world were we going to cope? When it came to such uncertainty and how to approach it, I hearkened back to lessons that I learned from my dad. Two years ago, I made brief mention of my father who came from a low-income home in which both parents worked in a chicken hatchery in order to make ends meet for their family of five children. My father held a paying job since age seven in order to help supplement the family income during the Great Depression. Although no one in his family had ever attended college, he was determined to become the first to do so and he made an assessment of what it would take for him to pay for this endeavor. He noticed when he visited the hatchery that individuals who held the position of a chicken sexer made a very decent income. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with this particular job description, their task was to determine the gender of a newly hatched chick, whether it was destined to become a hen or a rooster, which back in the 1940s took some considerable skill. My father saved money from his other job so he could pay for attendance to a chick sexing school in order to attain a certification that would verify his competency in determining the chicken's gender. Now the curriculum and payment methods of the school were very interesting as you might imagine. You paid the school on a weekly basis and you were not allowed to leave the school with a certificate until you could correctly determine the gender of 100 chicks in sequential order with a greater than 95% accuracy. When my father arrived to the school, he found there were people who had been attending for months as they could not quite get over the hump of achieving the 95% threshold. 
My father, who had very limited funds, was counting on his keen eyesight and belief in himself to pass the course in as short a time as possible. Thank goodness he was able to pass. Here's a picture of my dad with his certificate. In a mere two weeks, he was able to start his college fundraising mission in earnest. He attended college his freshman year, and every weekend he would hitchhike home in order to work in the hatchery in order to raise money. Now, counting on being able to hitchhike successfully and safely is a fairly foreign concept to most of us today. And I never thought to ask my dad how many times did he cut it close to the wire getting to and from school. He obviously determined that the most economical way for him to accomplish his goal was via this mode of transportation, and he executed his plan with persistence and determination. Even though he required to take an entire year away from college in order to raise enough money, in the end, he was able to graduate and went on to postgraduate school and later enjoyed a successful professional career in dentistry and as a leader in his state and national societies for his profession. Go figure. I unfortunately lost my father in 2019, six months after beginning my presidency, and it saddens me that he's not alive to hear his son give a nod and thank him for the lessons taught and how I've been able to apply his approach to my current position and circumstances. I'll summarize this process taken from his story as follows. Number one, assess your situation. Be very intentional and as thorough as possible in fact gathering. Identify the biggest obstacles and the biggest opportunities, whether they may concern economic impact, safety and wellness, logistical issues, technology, whatever the main issue might be. Number two, focus on what is most important. For my dad, it was financing an education that would lead to a professional career. For the AAN, it's our mission and our vision statements, the North Star for all of our decisions. Number three, Formulate an action plan and execute it. Be disciplined and set targets and metrics to measure. My father kept a log concerning his college expenses and paychecks from the hatchery, knowing precisely how much money he needed to raise. The AAN keeps a scorecard in which targets are set and progress is measured on a continuous basis. Number four. Communicate. The AAN has kept connected with our membership throughout a multifaceted approach which has been constant and consistent in its messaging. During the pandemic, it has been particularly critical that we stay connected with a constant flow of information to and from the membership. And number five, persistence and determination win the day. Much like my father's example, the solutions weren't completed without considerable focus and persistence over a period of several years. The AAN also has a long-term, multi-year focus plan, which has required commitment and dedication from our members. Let me emphasize this last bullet point by referencing a few quotes from a diverse group of observers. The first is from the New York Times best-selling author, Angela Duckworth, who wrote the book Grit. As much as talent counts, effort counts twice. Again, as much as talent counts, effort counts twice. The next quote comes from the world champion baseball manager of the Los Angeles Dodgers, Tommy Lasorda, who said the difference between the impossible and the possible lies in one's determination. Again, the difference between the impossible and the possible lies in one's determination. And perhaps my favorite quote addressing this critical point comes from the 30th president of the United States, Calvin Coolidge, who said, nothing in this world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful people with talent. 
Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. But persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. In January of 2020, we held our annual AAN Board of Directors Retreat, which is based on a selected topic which we discuss over a two or three day period. This past year, we invited a futurist to help us formulate possible scenarios ranging from the optimistic to the expected to the abject disaster. Little did we know at that time how prescient this exercise would prove to be. Although we did not have a worldwide pandemic on our list, the lesson from discussing the scenarios in that disruption and the uncertainty that comes with it are inevitable. But the possibilities for successful solutions always exist. By implementing the focused five-part approach, I'm pleased to report that the 2020 and 21 story, while not completely written, has been one of a resounding success. So let's take a quick look at the results of the past year from applying the above approach. We were able to provide the annual meeting on demand which contained the entire content from our 2019 meeting in Philadelphia, which contained over 500 hours and over 200 courses for free with accompanied CME credits. We also were able to share over 1,600 posters which were to have been presented at our 2020 annual meeting. And to date, these have received over 200,000 views. We were able to establish telehealth, giving our members resources to quickly implement this technology into their practices and receive payment for the services rendered. We also were able to establish the COVID-19 Financial Relief Fund in which we raised over $250,000 and distributed this to members who were facing economic hardship as a result of the pandemic. And we also partnered with other not-for-profit healthcare organizations in providing discounted personal protection equipment to those members who are having challenges in receiving N95 masks, face shields, and gowns, at the end of the day, we distributed over 100,000 units. This past year, we were also able to successfully implement virtual meetings with a record-setting attendance for our sports concussion conference, our advanced practice provider, 10-part educational series, and our fall conference and as you're currently enjoying, hopefully, our 2021 annual meeting. We were able to establish quite quickly a COVID-19 website, which provided the latest reliable updates for scientific information concerning COVID-19, as well as educational resources, practice management resources, telehealth, and much other content with over 300,000 visits since it was established last April. We also were able to continue with our numerous publications, podcasts, our spotlight series and webinars with over 300 related articles, commentaries, and blogs. This past year has also been a year of transition in which we were able to welcome a new chief executive officer, chief financial officer, and editor-in-chief. We also had several advocacy wins for our members which resulted in simplification of our documentation requirements and improved reimbursement on average 7% per neurologist for seeing their patients in their practice or hospital. Telehealth became permanently implemented as a tool enabling timely access for neurologic care. We also were able to continue our very popular leadership programs and provide content to our members so they could take it back to their communities, their practices, their academic centers, and to the nation at whole to improve the outcomes for neurologists and patients suffering from neurologic diseases. A real 
joy and privilege of being president is that I get to assign task forces and during my tenure I was able to establish the general neurology, patient and public engagement, and industry relations task forces which provided information back to the board of directors which we will use to implement for our 2021 strategic plan. In the area of social justice, we were ahead of the curve. And in 2017, under the presidency of Dr. Ralph Sacco, we established the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Joint Coordinating Council. And this past summer, it was my honor to assign the first ever special commission to address the issues of anti-racism. This commission presented a 14-page detailed action list which was presented to the Board of Directors last September and accepted. And this has resulted in several actionable items that we will be implementing this year into our strategic plan. And we have created as a result a new Board of Directors goal and a new value for the American Academy of Neurology, which was the ideas principle of inclusion, diversity, equity, anti-racism, and social justice. And as a result of our political unrest, our Brain Political Action Committee is focused with a laser beam-like uh, intent on neurologic and healthcare issues to improve our specialty and the outcome of those patients who we serve. I am very happy to report that through such operational discipline, your AAN is in a very strong financial position far exceeding our budget expectations for 2020. We also set new records for membership last year, and the results from our most recently completed membership survey, which we conduct every three years, revealed the highest score ever recorded for member satisfaction and the perceived value they received from their AAN membership. I can safely say that it is not by accident or simple good fortune that the aforementioned list of major accomplishments occurred despite facing an unprecedented number of disruptive forces. However, through making a thorough assessment of the situation, focusing on the most important thing, the AAN mission and vision statements, formulating and executing a plan communicating the plan, all with persistence and determination, we were able to navigate the uncertain times and accomplish great things these past two years. Dad, I hope you are proud that your son was paying attention this time. My heartfelt thanks to all of the AAN staff, member volunteers, and executive leadership of the AAN and to my board of directors, who I've leaned on heavily during my tenure. All of you have been truly remarkable. None of the aforementioned results would have been possible without your dedicated efforts. My biggest thanks, however, go to my family who have supported me throughout my journey in neurology and with the AAN, particularly my wife of 40 years, Laurel, who has put up with countless phone calls, late night Zoom meetings, weekends of my absence, and hours of patient listening as I was trying to solve the problems of the day. I love you and would not be here without you. At the beginning of my term, it was my hope that the AAN would continue to advance its mission of enhancing member career satisfaction. Quite honestly, there were moments when I felt the challenges of this past year would create a serious roadblock that would keep me from accomplishing this goal. While we always aspire for great heights, I'm personally amazed and so proud of what the AAN team has accomplished for the betterment of our profession and for our patients. I want to end my address by saying how humbled and honored I am for being given the opportunity to lead this incredible organization for the past two very eventful years. I will soon be placing the gavel into the very capable hands of Dr. Orley Advitzer, who I have 
every confidence will continue the upward trajectory of the AAN. The ancient Roman philosopher and politician Cicero was credited with saying gratitude is not only the greatest of all virtues, but the parent of all virtues. And I, for one, have certainly nothing but an internally grateful heart for our beloved profession and for the American Academy of Neurology. So, my friends and colleagues, until we are able to meet once again face to face, please stay healthy and stay strong.